people can undermine proof of work in a collaborative um, attack environment to where you can have pooled hash power start mining their own chain and then publishing it and broadcasting it to the network, which ends up coming through and having like a rewrite when you start talking about republishing what occurred in the on the blockchain, right? So you can you can have a competitive mining and get and it's all a chase to who's got the highest block height, right? And then if you broadcast that and now have a series of changes that you occurred, you can play both sides of it on a proof of work network. And that's where the 51% attack comes from. So it's this whole race of like, who's got the longest chain. And then on the chain that you know you're attacking, you can do bad things on knowing that you did not reciprocate those events on the right side of the chain, you know, are the, uh, you know, the chain that you've been mining with all your pooled hash power. And then you publish at a certain point that, Hey, I'm ahead. And here's, here's the reality of the changes. And now you've, us, you've, you've eliminated any of the activity that was on those. So you're not including other people's transactions. You're not doing any of that when you publish that long chain. That's part of the direct attack on, on, you know, proof of work. And it's, it's not that the technology is not functioning. The technology is actually functioning the way it's supposed to. It's just the behavior that people are doing is the problem, right? But the be you can't control the behavior, right? It's all about the incentive. The incentive is for somebody to try to attack it, right? Because they, it's a, it could be done for malicious reasons. It could be done for um, profit reasons or whatever, right? And that's what's happened essentially with Bitcoin, some of the other stuff. So it all comes down again to a behavior driven type of system. And then people that are contributing to that, if they believe in that system to be better, then it's a matter of pivoting it to where you're de-incentivizing that activity because all that effort that they're going to spend to try to attack it, they're going to lose the second it forks. And it's the same way that the A6 and the FPGA work that's being done on a particular algorithm gets essentially forked off when a pivot of the algorithm has been done because now all the work that they've just done is now for nothing, right? So I don't know if that helps, but if something like POS can work, it'd be huge. I think the ultimate check is the hybrid model. I think that, I mean, based on everything I know, architecturally, cryptographically, proof of work, understanding the, the providence of information, understanding the incentive mechanisms behind everything, in my time since 2011, I firmly believe it's going to end up being some version of a proof of stake, proof of work hybrid to where you can have checkpoints. You have them both keeping each other in check. I think that's the ultimate kind of mechanism. The problem right now is the incentive side on the proof of stake side creates oligarchies, right? Which then poison pill the whole thing because now you're going to have the, the checkpoint folks with power that if a bad event happens on the proof of work side if you own but if you have if you're the orchestrator on both sides you now own it to not just attack the proof of work side but you also can let the checkpoint pass because you own the proof of stake side because you have the highest stake so it comes down to a mix of the functionality of technology and then some kind of de-incentive of behavior that poisons the the want or need to become an oligarchy on it. The stuff that I mean, I know that I've been producing is like, oh, none of this stuff's ever going to work. Nobody wants to do it. And in some circles, a lot of that stuff's actually kind of true. I think. And I think it's the same reason I put a, a, a tweet out and a um, a comment out on what I had just did for the Ravencoin network, and it was like it's like a warranty. Like people like the idea of a warranty. They read the basic fine print and say something has a warranty, but nobody registers for a warranty. They don't care, right? It's like like you have other things to do in your life, right? So you're like, oh, cool, it has two-year warranty. And then you go about your life. And that warranty can come and go and expire, and you may or may not have used it. You don't care. You just like to have the umbrella effect that there's it's there. And then when you want to exercise on that warranty, it's usually a pain in the ass. You have to go out and fill out a form. You have to do all this other stuff, right? Blockchain tech in general is a lot like that in the concept that it sounds good. A lot of things can happen with it, but how does it affect you personally in the space of it serving a service or a function? And at the end of the day, it's trying to explain either the warranty or like why TCP IP routing is like important for the internet to function. You just want to get on and do something on Instagram. You don't give a crap about how those pixels and those, those bits went across the server, right? It's like, Hey, that, you're saying a service function says I can take a picture and I can share it with people. Cool. How do I do that? 
that's the part that people care about, right? That's the UX experience. It's the functionality of what you're getting out of it. So the blockchain functional world needs to get into a space that is providing tools and services that meet an intent that really looks like the current existing centralized world in a way, but gives them a different level of security and providence and all that other stuff in the background that they'll get new features out of it, such as, hey, this thing that you just bought, it has a, has a uh, unique serial number. And when you take pictures with that, you can flip an option on to record that on chain. And what does that give to you? Well, when you go to sell it, you can give them this one little key that gives them access to all those things that you felt like sharing to it and say, hey, I took this cool picture with Nelly with this thing one time. And you know, here's the link to that event. Right now, it's under your profile on maybe Instagram and you don't want to give everybody like access to other stuff. Maybe you can give them that one picture or something, but you have no way to really tie what uh, happens with an asset to its history of providence um, that isn't not associated with you, right? It's it's because it was associated with you to where there are there are opportunities to change that. I mean, in, in cars, it's around the VIN numbers and car faxes, right? Like what happened with this car? Certain things that are expensive in assets, we do stuff like that with. We already do stuff that would be that would make sense on a authentication chain, right? Uh, title services for a house, that kind of stuff. Like having those events that are happening in the background tied to a chain that is then, you know that it wasn't edited, uh, I think is critical. Um, but it needed to just happen in the background. And you have that now guarantee that somebody didn't go in there and edit it. And if they tried to, there's an entire network that's preventing them to edit the original record. Again, all those things being said, it doesn't directly people care that that's fact that that's a blockchain drive in that, right? And that's the issue. That's the genuine issue is people don't care what drives it. Just the fact that it works and it's consistent and they don't have to go prove it 50 times, right? Anything that changes that activity for people is going to fundamentally change the user experience. And I think firmly that if companies embrace and lean into it, and they can start putting things like on blockchains on rails and then it streamlines services and guarantees and customer verifications and all these things that are kind of a pain in the ass right now. And then you find out that, oh, that was on a blockchain. That's where it really starts to add value. And then the transactions that are occurring on that sub network in the background is what's creating value for the token itself because it's being used all the time. It's being used to just automate and f facilitate things in the background and you can circumstantially own a function, you can own tokens on that that fuels that that system. And that's, but we're, that's a hugely complex organism to kind of explain to people without boring them to death. So um, I think blockchain is a lot like that. Um, I think foundationally it, it's, it's not just a database. And that's a lot of the, the Ma Bitcoin Maximus and all these people that are in this that just are looking at the fiduciary purposes of it are missing something very huge when you start talking providence of well, after you have a semi-trusted source write a piece of data and I start having people interact with that semi-trusted when the first data write is it's pivotal forward looking of that first set of information and if it ends up becoming fraudulent at the end of the day I have transactional history of it. You know, that's the part that I just like in every argument I get into folks. And I wouldn't say argument. I'd say discussion. Like, that's the one part they missed. Like, well, it's garbage in. People could put bad data in there. Well, no shit. It's happening right now on databases. You know, and not saying that this because it's the first series of information is very hard to, to prove that it was right. The fact that I take a video and a picture. Do you believe that? You know, I, it's a video, it's video proof. Well, we already see people can spoof videos and stuff, right? So there needs to be some level of at least the answer, I think, is the history of it. The continuous updates of that same thread. The first initial right, and then the continuance of that right. The continuance of the providence of that right. And then if you get about five steps in, you go, wait a minute here, something's wrong. This doesn't look right. Something's inconsistent, because now I've created a threading of information around that first right, that first initial thing in a database if you go and change any one of those uh, those rights after it you can change and throw off the understanding of what that is, information is you can kind of throw it off the trail per se right and that is the delta there that's what we're trying to fix at the end of the day is like can i have something that's canonical in nature and very very hard to go back and try to change
right? And if that is much better than a database, which it is, then that's the stuff that should rain through over a long period of time through a lot of iterations and testing and speeding up and what makes sense to have in a semi permissionless, full permissionless environment with a lot of chain and off chain swapping.